Okay. Today we're going to start the Samachay. That's 65. What happened? It's the wrong Gemara. Okay. Uh, we're going to start right on top of the page. Tanya. We thank Hashem. We're able to learn Taira every day. And this chos of our learning, we should have a English immediately. We are for Shlema. Okay, Tanya was taught in a brisa. Hamuter hana mechaverai. If someone takes a vow that he's not going to have benefit from his friend, ein matirin layala befanav. He can he can get that vow annulled, but he needs the friend to be in front of him when he gets the vow annulled. Now, the easy explanation for that is because if the friend was there, let's say, the friend was there when he took the vow, and then he later sees, let's say Reuben takes a vow, he's not going to have benefit from Shimon. And Shimon was there when he took the vow. Reuben says, that's it. I'm never having benefits from you. Then, morning. And then uh, Reuben gets the vow annulled. If Shimon doesn't know that he got the vow and all, and then Ruvain, and then Shimon sees Ruvain having benefit from him, you know, walking on his property and all the things that we said he can't have benefit from. So then he's going to think that what's he doing? He's violating his uh, he's violating his uh, his vow. So Mipneachshad, because we don't want it to look bad that someone is violating a vow, so he has to get it annulled in front of him, and he should know that if he's going to have benefit that he already took care of that. That's a simple explanation for it. There's another explanation based on your, the Yerushalmi. Is, we, we we, I'm, I'm just, I'm not at the Mishnah, I'm just at the top of the page, Tanya. Yeah, but would the same thing apply if they took the vow without the friend present? Oh, well, that's a very good question. This, this reason doesn't apply if the friend didn't know that he took the vow. This is only this. This whole reason would only apply if he took the vow. That's that's, <coughs> that's correct. No, I was asking that. No, that's a good point. That's a good point. That's a, there's a big discussion in the in the commentaries. The Ran doesn't even mention if the person is there originally. I, I think it's a, it's assumed that he took the vow in front of him. There is another reason, um, based in the Ushalmi. The Ushalmi says that we want to embarrass the person. When he's getting his vow annulled. Now, I'm not sure why we need to embarrass him, but it would be a good thing to get his vow annulled. We want him to, to get his vow annulled in front of the person. As if, like, you have to apologize. You know, so that we need the person there when you get the vow annulled. Isn't that like one of the reasons given Oh, maybe. bring a carbon. To be maybe, so you don't do maybe, again. maybe that's part of the atonement. But if, uh -huh. Like the shot is for the person to be embarrassed. I think that even if the sex wasn't present, he would have to annul it in front of him. No. If the reason is because because you want the person to be embarrassed, they're taking a vow. Right. So then you would have to annul it in front of the person that he took the vow. Right. And, so those would be two reasons. No, but he would have to to annul it in front of the person, even if the person wasn't aware. Oh, even if it wasn't aware, yeah. So very good. So that would make a difference between um, if the person had to be there. Very good. Very good. Yeah, Beautiful. You're teaching me. <laughs> no. Very nice. That would that would make a difference. The Ram doesn't mention that difference, but um, what the Ram does mention is that it's unclear. From this Gemara, if when you annul a vow, if you need the person that you took the vow about, if you need him present, it's unclear if that's um, only if the vow was relevant to him or even if it's not relevant. That's unclear. If you took a vow, Reuben takes a vow, I'm not going to have benefit from Shimon. So then, of course, Shimon has to be there when he annuls the vow. That's what we're, that's what we're learning now. But let's say you took a vow in front of Shimon, but it doesn't really involve Shimon. Took a vow that he's not going to smoke. It's not going to, you know. And then Shimon, but it was in front. Of, it was in front of Shimon. And now Shimon sees him smoking. So you would have the same shot. What are you doing? I thought you took a vow. So you would have to know in front. But but it doesn't involve him at all, right? 
So, so it's unclear what, it, how, what, what are the parameters of this halacha? Like, in which cases it applies? Would it be similar, like, to when one needs to like solve a crowd and goes in front of the rabbis? Like, the crowd doesn't involve the rabbis, but no, that, that's a different story. The rabbis actually annul the vow. Yeah. Here we're talking about a second part that maybe the person is going to see that he, it's, it's not part of the annulment. It's, um, you know, you're getting into another part of this. Let's finish this and then we'll discuss. But what, what you're bringing up is another point. If someone violates this halacha that we just learned, this brisa, and he does annul a vow in front of someone, and he does annul a vow not in front of the person that he was supposed to, and whatever the case is that he's supposed to, is the vow annulled? <laughs> That's a very interesting discussion that Duran uh, uh, says, but we can't get into it until we start, uh, until we uh, do the Gemara. Minani Mili. Minani Mili, from where do we know that you have to annul the vow in front of the other person? So it gets quite complicated now to annul the vow. You can't just go to the rabbi, uh, you know, after Shachris. You have to find the guy that you took the vow in front of and you have to bring him there. You have to, like, make an appointment with the secretary. Amar. Amar of Nachman. Rav Nachman says. Where's that from, Yitzhi? <laughs> Uh, Hashem says to Moshe in Midian, Go return to Egypt because all the people that wanted your life have died. Okay, so I think what the Gemara is about to do here is it's about to read the Pasuk a little bit different. I think that's what's happening. Whatever the case is, Hashem tells Moshe in Midian, Return to Egypt because you can uh, you can now um, uh, live comfortably there, and you'll be able to do your mission that Hashem had spoken just spoken to him about. Go to Paray and all of that. Hashem had just told him. He says now return to to Mitzrayim because the people that wanted your life are now dead. Okay, he's not going to live comfortable in Mitzrayim, uh, but he'll he doesn't have to fear for his life. Amalai b'midyan nadarta. He says to him, what's he saying in Midian? Why does the Pasuk say in Midian? Hashem says to Moshe in Midian. What Hashem is saying is, B'midian nadarti, you took a vow in Midian. What was the vow? He vowed to, to Yisrael that he won't leave. He married his daughter. Leich veheter nadarcha b'midian. Go and annul your vow in Midian. Now, I think what the, what the Gemara is doing is it's reading the Pasuk slightly different. I think so. I'm, I'm, maybe I'm making this up. But when the Pasuk says, Hashem says to Moshe in Midian, Leich shuv Mitzrayim, go return to Egypt. It's actually supposed to, according to the Gemara, what it really means is, but Hashem says to Moshe, the Midian Leich, go to Midian. I think that's the chat. I mean, I, didn't, I don't see what the, the, the commentaries are just ignoring that. Um, Go to Midian and annul your vow in Midian. And then you can go back to Egypt. Because this whole conversation that Hashem has with Moshe is by the Sneth, which is not in Midian. And then Hashem speaks to Moshe in Midian. <clears throat> he doesn't send them back right away. Obviously, you have to go back to Midian. If you look at the Pesukim, you'll see. You have to go back to Midian. And then he gets sent to Mitzrayim. Remember that whole conversation that he says, go to Egypt and... Ah, so what was it? What's the Ksiv? As it says, Vayoyal Moshe. Moshe agreed to marry to and to stay in Midian. Ain Allah Elashbua. We don't really have uh, the word Vayoyal often in, in the text. Vayoyal Moshe. Moshe agreed. Um, he swore. That he would not return to Egypt. Right. That he would not return to Egypt. Now he has to annul the vow because now he's returning to Egypt. It, it, right? Is the point of the story that he annulled it not in front of the people who were affected by his vow? Well, now he has to annul it in, in front of Yisrael. 
So that's the point. That's the whole point over here. Is that since he took the vow in front of Yisra, so he has to annul the vow in front of Yisra. I took it. What do you have in there? I, uh, the, the I took it as okay. an answer to Hillel's question. That he took a vow that affected the people in Egypt. They didn't know about it, so he was able to annul it without not in front of them. Oh. Uh, no, okay. but the real the vow wasn't yeah. affecting the people in Egypt. The vow was affecting Yisrael. Yisrael wanted him to stay there because he was just better. married his daughter. Yeah, so we don't really have an answer to that question if it has to be yeah. uh, who it's affecting. No, no, it, just because he married his daughter. Work for Pharaoh? Yes, yeah. That's a measure that he worked for Pharaoh. But he married his daughter. He wanted him to stay with his daughter. This guy comes from Egypt. He shows up. Maybe he's just going to, you know, live with her and then just run off. That's not good. So he made him swear that he's going to stay there. So how do we know that that Vayoyal means, or Allah means a Shua? It says in the, in Yechezkel, Yutayan says, that the, this eagle is going to come from Babylon and we're going to destroy the temple and and uh, <coughs> and uh, take away the king and, and it says over there that he that he that the king had come into um, an oath or a, a swear <coughs> with with Nebuchadnezzar with the king of Babel. <laughs> Came into what was the oath? So now the Gemara explains what the oath is. We quote another pasuk. Sorry? It doesn't seem like an oath, right? It, this is all based on. But Yoel Maish doesn't mean an oath. Doesn't literally mean an oath. It means that he agreed to stay there. He, it means he he agreed. Uh, oh, okay. He agrees to, to stay oh. there. But we're saying that the, the, that term by which is an uncommon term, is used to say that he actually made an oath. That's how the Gemara is learning. So what was the oath that was made to Nebuchadnezzar? By Yovi Allah. It says, "Began be Melech Nebuchadnezzar Mar Rashir Shpiyah Belikim Chayim," and he also rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar that he had made him swear by the living God. Maimer do say, "What was the rebellion? What did he? Uh, what happened here?" <coughs> so we're talking about Tzidkia, Tzidkio, that was the last king. Um, so one second, the last king. Um, had made an oath to Nebuchadnezzar and then violated it. So what happened? And uh, Tzidkiel finds Nebuchadnezzar that he's eating a live rabbit. I know it's a rabbit. Should I say it's a rabbit? Amalei, so I guess he walked into to the room when he was there without knocking or something. I don't know. I saw him on the street. Is it a live rabbit or a raw rabbit? Is it raw or alive? Chaya could mean raw or alive. What do you see your commentary say? Either. Okay. It's a swear to me that this is going to be confidential. What you've just uh, witnessed is confidential and swear to me that you're not going to tell anyone. The rabbit part. Yeah. That's uh, uh that's that's not in the text. Well, Ishtaba he swore. What's the base? Ishtabale. We'll say if I become it starts, Sitkio Bigufei. Sitkio was in a lot of pain. Um doesn't say what the pain was. It says that he wanted to to reveal it. What does it say? He was physically suffering. Does your commentary say that he was physically suffering? Bigufe? What is it? Why are they trying to say bigufe? Bigufe could mean physically. It also could mean he was like uh, just like very um, uh, distraught. Yeah, yeah, but then it explains as he wanted to tell people what he had seen. Right. He could not. So yeah. So it was like one of these things that he couldn't. Uh, he really wanted to tell people, and he couldn't say. So it was bothering him. So, so he uh, annulled the oath. 
and he said it. So he revealed something that was confidential. That's a no-no. Um, could people get sued for that? A lawyer or a doctor oh, or something? Confidentiality agreements? Oh, boy. Yeah. Oh, boy. It's a big deal. It's not probably the bread and butter right there. So that's a big deal. Um, at the, at the but how do you, how do you, how do you, um, if you know the secret for McDonald's uh, recipes and go around? No, I'm not them. talking about that. I'm talking about, let's say, a psychologist. Oh, uh, yeah, for sure. Says uh, something. Google. But how do you, how do you assess what the value of that is? How do you sue? So sometimes there's just, um, don't, there's no actual damage awards. Can you get payment for that? In America, it depends. Oh, yeah. Whose agenda you're supporting? Okay. <laughs> okay. So Nebuchadnezzar the Kamavazli Nebuchadnezzar hears that people are 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 shaming him. They they heard you heard what Nebuchadnezzar ate. He ate a live a live rabbit. So he brings uh, the Sanhedrin and Tzidkio in front of him. You see what Tzidkio is doing. Did he not swear to me that he's not going to do this? Amalei says, I annul the oath. Is that acceptable? Can you annul an oath? I think that that's the shot over here. Amalei in. He said, yeah, well, you can annul an oath. So Tzidkyo did was halachically correct. Somehow Nebuchadnezzar would accept that. Amalehu, b'fanav ayafilus lay b'fanav. Can you annul the oath even not in front of the person that you took the oath to. Here we have someone that took an oath to him, directly affecting him, and he annulled it, not in front of him. Amrile, the fun of the Sanhedrin says, no, he's supposed to do it, the fun of. Amalahun, vatan mayaptisan. So he said, what did you do? You didn't do that. Look at you, he tells the Sanhedrin. You annulled it, not in front of the, the person, which is Nebuchadnezzar. My time, I'm recently sit here. Why don't you tell sit here that you can't annul an oath unless I'm there? Miyad, Yeshu, Laoretz, Yidmu, Zikne Bastien. They sat on the ground, silent, the elders of the daughter of Zion, referring to the Sanhedrin. I'm Rabbi Yitzchak. Rabbi Yitzchak says, Shasham to Karmi Tachtem. He took away the, the cushions from underneath them, which probably means that he made them not, uh, that they lost their jobs. They couldn't be the Sanhedrin. Okay. okay. The comments are here. They, they, really they, what did they say? They, 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 they put them in the hands of golden chairs and showed them honor. And then when they ruled oh. directly, he threw them on the ground, oh, so tied before. them of horses, and had them dragged through the streets. Oh, so the, it's a lot worse than just uh, that they were taken off the chair. But in this case, um, the correct thing would have been like for, for that person not to take the oath. He was going to keep quiet, or then he didn't have a choice. He had to take the oath. was the king. We're going to kill him. He was saying it was the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin annulled it. Now the Ran now goes into this discussion: Was it actually annulled when the Sanhedrin violated the halacha by annulling a vow not in front of the person? Did did it get annulled? So this, um, the Ran himself says that he thinks that it does get annulled. He says, others say that it doesn't get annulled. So why did the Sanhedrin do it? He says, well, it was a mistake. The, the, the question is why the Sanhedrin do it? Is it, it what about the fact that he was a guy? Oh, that's an interesting point. He, he's asking what we're learning now is that if you take a vow, you have to annul it in front of a, uh, the person that you, the vow was taken in front of. The question is, does that apply to a non-Jew as well? If you take a vow to a non-Jew, do you have to annul it in front of the non-Jew? You have to go back and look at the logic. If it's because of chashad, that the person may think that you don't keep vows, and maybe it's uh, maybe it's the same thing. Maybe it's the, be the same rule. If it's because of Nebusha to embarrass the person, you shouldn't have taken a vow. So then maybe the same thing, you would still be embarrassed. The, the logic is there by both of them, unless we turn it into a, like a ritual law. But by if, if the logic is the way that it's quoted from the two possibilities from the Yushalmi, and then the same thing would apply to a non-Jew. And then we see it over here as well by uh, Nebuchadnezzar. This itself is a proof. I think there will be, I don't think it is. Like it's 
That's a, that's a good point. That's a good point. That's a good point. Now, the question is, why did the Sanhedrin make this mistake? Why did the Sanhedrin do this? So Taisvis and the Ran, they give it an answer that because Tzidkiyo was so disturbed that he, uh, he wanted to reveal the secret and he was so disturbed that he couldn't reveal it, he wasn't able to function as a king. So, uh, and he was mis al So it would be a mitzvah for them to. Now, it sounds like a very lame excuse. It's not a. It doesn't sound like a real. Uh, but anyway, they're saying this like with all seriousness. So maybe. Is there a concept when it comes to lashon hara that? Um, it's really, really bothering you that you're allowed to say it. There's some exceptions, I think. Yeah, spouses, uh-huh. things like that. Did you know that? That there are there some exceptions to lashon hara? If there's lashon hara that it's really, really bothering you, you're allowed to say it. You have to get it off your chest. Tell me where it is. I'll tell you if it's lashon hara. <laughs> <laughs> The guy says, I don't speak Lashon Hara, but I'll tell you who does. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then he gives another answer that says um, that because the king had told them that they should annul it, so it was a mitzvah to listen to the king, so they annulled it, even though there wasn't the way to annul it. Also seems like a shvach Anyway, Whatever the case is, there's a problem here. Okay, Plus next Gemara. Next Mishnah. Last chapter of Tanakh. Uh-huh. It's right before. Uh... Okay. Rabbi Meir Reimer. Rabbi Meir says, Yeshtvam Shem Kanoilad Vena Kanoilad. We spoke about Noilad before, that if there's a change in circumstance, uh, according to the sages, you weren't allowed to use the change in circumstance to annul a, to annul a vow. Comes along Rabbi Meir now and says, that there are certain things that seem like a change in circumstance, but nevertheless, you're still able to use them an olive out. What are they? Uh, before we get to that, we have now a statement. But the sages didn't agree to him. Now, if you look on the side, it says, and the sages did agree to him. So there's two versions to this text. What does your English say? The sages agreed or didn't agree? Did not. Did not. You have the translation of, of the text that we have. Okay. Kate said, what's the case that Reb Meir says would be, you see that in your Gemara uh, mm-hmm. of Nassim? You see the Ein Chachamim and inside it says, the Chachamim mm-hmm. Maidim it switches. Okay. <laughs> There's a, sometimes, sometimes it's different gear size, but when one gear says yes and the other one says no, that's like really difficult. Rush. You already have the rush. Oh, really? There's the- versions that have contradictory uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 contradictory text. text. Yeah. Kate said, what's the case? In the Mishnah, it says, right. Right. so there's got to be some sort of star over there. A gimel. So find the gimel and then see if it says, oh, gimel. Is it a gimel with a circle or is it a gimel with a bracket? Here's a gimel with a bracket. Yeah. There's too many. Yeah, I'm assuming this Gamara has the most accurate gear. No. 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 We don't have storage. Oh. Oh. Uh, my, I guess, yeah. They redid it. Okay, Kate said, what's the case? Omar Kainam She'eni, probably. Nicias Plainus Shaviyara. Takes a vow. I'm not going to marry uh, this, this girl. Her father's evil. <laughs> Amrulai, they tell him, Mais, he died already. He, 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 he repented. Yeah, that's an old story. Don't worry about it. So, what just happened there was that so there was I, a change in circumstance. Yeah. And nevertheless, we're going to annul the vow based on that. I'm never going to go into that house. There's an evil dog or there's a 
a snake in there. This is like a change in circumstance. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to see two opinions about how this works in the Gemara. Because officially, if there's a change in circumstance, you can't use it. But here, Bain Chacham and and the sages don't agree. And of course, you would say, according to that other version, the sages do agree. And the Chachamim agree. Uh huh. Okay. The Gemara says, Kainam Shani, it quotes the Mishnah. Why are you t- telling me that it works? It shouldn't work. It's Nailad. Nailad is a change in circumstance. You can't use a change in circumstance to annul a vow retroactively. He didn't think about that originally. He took the vow and they took the vow. Ravuna says the way you're explaining it. Ravuna says that he took a vow with a stipulation. It's not really Nailad. It's not a way of annulling the vow. The vow was. That while the dog is there, I'm not going to go in. While this person is evil, I'm not going to marry the daughter. Or, or, you know, but now he did shuva. So that, that was the stipulation. He did shuva. So now the vow is off. So that's why this is a way out. So it sounds like he doesn't even need to annul it. That's what the run says. Would the other If, yeah. Oh, back over there, that was a different discussion. That had to do with if we trusted that he would keep the stipulation after he had violated his house. It's a different story. Rabbi Yechanan Amar, Rabbi Yechanan says, this is a jump over to Eretz Yisrael, Kvar me sequaras at Shuvah Karmelei. Not that there was a stipulation there. Yechanan, his interpretation of this Mishnah is that the vow was made by mistake. It was not by mistake, but it was made on a mistaken assumption. You thought the guy was a bad guy. You thought that uh, that the dog was there. You thought when you took the vow, he was already dead. He was already, the, the dog already did shuva. Not the dog did shuva. The, the man did shuva. The, uh, the dog died. The snake died. Yeah. All of those. Um, can a dog do shuva? That's a good question. Okay. <laughs> okay. For that joke, the guy, his dog can uh, do all these things. So he tells him, uh, he's t- showing his friend all the things the dog could do. So then uh, um, says, uh, fetch. So the dog jumps on the couch and starts to say, you're the worst owner, you're the thing. <laughs> How could you? And <laughs> so what's going on? Says, he thought I said kvetch. <laughs> okay. So, um, two interpretations here. Either it's toila nidre, he was made a stipulation on the vow, or the vow was made on a mistaken assumption. Masa Rababa, Rababa has a question, it's going to be a question on Rabbi Yechanan. The next Mishnah, not right away the next Mishnah, but the Mishnah on the next page on Samach Vav, a few Mishnahs from now, has the following case. says, I take a vow, I'm never going to marry that woman. She's ugly. It turns out she's beautiful. It's all in the mind. And makeup, right? Um, no, other, other, sometimes other people say, you know, she's beautiful, she's beautiful, she's beautiful. And then the person, oh, I didn't realize that. Maybe he wasn't wearing glasses. It has to do with a lot of things have to do with other what people tell you. She was a minor. A few years later, like she has well, a uh, dark complexion. Turns out she has a uh, uh, a white complexion. Ruka. She's short. I'm not going to marry her. Turns out she's tall. Mutterba. He's permissible to marry her. Not because. She was ugly and became beautiful. She was dark and she came white. She was short and she became tall. The reason is because it was, it was a mistake. Okay, now. Let's say 
why do I have this Mishnah repeating sort of the same thing again? So according to Rav Huna, there's no problem because Rav Huna said the first Mishnah that we just learned was when he says, I'm not going to marry this girl because her father is wicked. And then turns out that he did tshuva or he died. So that's talking about because there was a stipulation. I'm not going to marry her because of the father. The father's not there or there's no problem with the father, then it would be fine. What is the other Mishnah? The other Mishnah that says, I'm not going to marry because she's ugly, turns out that she's really beautiful. So that was talking about that it was made up by, by it was a mistaken assumption. So the two Mishnayas are talking about different cases. One is a stipulation and one is a mistaken assumption. Let me just finish the question. But according to Rabbi Yechanan, that says that this Mishnah was all about mistaken assumption. I thought that the dog was alive. I thought that the father was alive. I thought that the father didn't do tshuva. And then, then that's when I took the vow. It turned out that he had already done tshuva by then. He had already, the dog had already died. So it was all a mistaken, not, it, it, was, a, it was all made on a mistaken uh, assumption. So it wasn't a stipulation. So then when the next Mishnah comes along and says the same story, that I thought she was ugly, but really she's not. Again, a mistake, mistaken assumption. Why do I need two Mishnayas to say the same thing? Gemara says Kasha. It's a question on Rabbi Yechman. No answer. It was based on something that wasn't true. Right, false information. Right. Right. Happens all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it really wasn't a horrible. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I have another mission here. By the Rab Mayor. Rab Mayor also says, Pace can leave in a cuss of Shabbatera. You can, if you want to null a vow, you can get the vow annulled from, uh, based on a Pasuk in the Torah. You say, you say to him, gives him a whole list. No. One is, don't take revenge. You're taking a vow over here, saying that you don't want to have benefit from this person or you don't want to give this person benefit. Don't you realize when you took that vow, that that's a violation of don't take revenge. But don't you realize that that's a violation of don't remember the bad? But that could be a violation of don't hate your brother in your heart. That could be a violation of love your fellow like yourself. Or that could be a violation of you should have your brother live with you. Um, that means you should support him if, if he's poor. And you're not able to support him because of the vow that you took. He says, if he says, oh, you're right, that's a prohibition. I wouldn't have taken the vow because of those, those, uh, then uh, we say, okay, so we can annul it. If someone says that he's not going to eat matzah on Pesach, right. it's not a vow because he's already took a, it's not an oath, it's not an oath right. because he already had sworn by Harsinai that he's going to. So now we can't swear that he's not going to. But if he takes a vow that he says that Matzah is forbidden to me. And then when Pesach during the shows month, up the during the month of Nisan, when Pesach shows up, he still can't eat the matzah unless he gets it annulled. Because he, he's not saying directly that he's not going to. He's making the object prohibited. That's like a loophole. So over here, <coughs> he's, he's getting so, around it and they're exactly. telling him that, no, you're, you're actually violating. No, that's exactly my point. Yeah. That Saying I'm going to refuse to do something. It's not a direct violation of Right. Right. Let's take a look at the, the Gemara. Um, before this, though, 
mention that um, we did have a discussion before that if you give the person a question, you pose a question that there's only one answer for because of out of embarrassment, you can't change, you can't say something different. We said that that was not a good way of annulling a vow. So why over here, Iran asks, why over here can he mention a mitzvah and say, if you knew that you were gonna violate a mitzvah, that you would, uh, that when he says, oh, uh, okay, I violate a mitzvah, okay. So then uh, we can now annul the vow, but maybe that's what he had to answer because he's ashamed to say anything different. So Duran says that these, these, uh, these mitzvahs here, people don't take so serious. Huh. So yeah, you tell a kid, uh, you know, share your lollipop. Abbas Yisrael, Abbas Yisrael, they heard it too many times. So. Some people will be crazy enough to say Yeah, we, the, I don't know if the Ran, did the Ran say that was the halacha? No, no, no. I, I, the Ran was explaining no, Rabbi Eliezer as saying that no. some people would be brazen to, um, to, to violate a mitzvah of kibbutz, of the yeah. honor of the father. Yeah, no, but I, I didn't see here, but you said the right. opinion in this case. And then it reminded me of Robert right. Yesterday. Right. It is. It's re it's referencing back to that where we said that. Uh, okay. The Gemara now says, "I'm a Rav Huna Bar Ketina." Maybe it's Rav Chana Bar Ketina, the Rabbanon, or maybe it's the Rabba. Different versions here. Yeah. So Rav Huna Bar Rav Ketina says to the Rabbanon, "Nema, why doesn't he say? Why don't we say that called the money lava line nafo? Someone gets poor. It's not my problem." I'm supposed to contribute. I'll contribute like everyone else. I'll give it to the Gabbai and let the Gabbai distribute whatever he wants. I took a vow that I'm not going to have give any benefit to Shimon, but but I can give money to the to the charity collector and he'll distribute it to whoever he wants. Maybe, maybe Shimon, maybe, but that's not a problem. Why does now, why does he get to annul his vow? based on that, no, you have to support him directly. There's other ways around that where he doesn't have to violate his, the mitzvah of the Torah and uh, he can also keep the vow. Right, he would give it to someone else or put it on a, put it on a rock. So the Gemara says like this, I'm a lay on the Yomer. There's, there's something funny about this. If he's saying it to the Rabbanon, then Amru lay on the is very odd. They said, I say, really should you know something's funny about that if you change it to <clears throat> Amar Lay and it really it does it's not Rabbanan it's really Rabba. Rafuna Bayrav Katina said to Rabba and then Amar Lay on the Rabba says I say there is there's a change in if it's plural or singular here there's a problem. So anyone that becomes poor they don't start off becoming poor where they end up in uh, uh, collecting with the, getting money from the charity collect. They end up there, how do they get poor first? First, they, they, they needed money for, to help them with the business, to get the business back on. There's a lot of stages before a person is already at the, getting money from the charity collector. So for that, they're supposed to get help from their friends and relatives, and he's not available to do that. So the, much before he goes to the charity collector, the, there's other people, his, his inner circle is supposed to be helping him that he doesn't have to end up in the, at the charity collect. Wow. And so he said, he took a vow. This, that's a, uh, an example of how this would work. I'm never helping that guy again because he uses his, uh, he uses it to buy, uh, right, right. Then I don't know if the, the all the rules of Lysisna Sachicha Bil Vavacha Haplarecha Kmech would come in. I don't know if that would play into this. Yeah, we had a, there was this person that was um, kept asking uh, money. money. And anyway, they had a drug problem. It was a lady. She had a drug problem. Anyway, um, she disappears for a few years. She comes back. She says, I haven't spoken to you in so long. Uh, you know, I met someone, I'm getting married. He's not Jewish, but I need money for a shaitel. <laughs> How all types of, uh, <laughs> all types of <laughs> clever ways of 
you know. Okay. So, um, Paiskan Ladam Miksubasishte. Paiskan Ladam Miksubasishte. Oh, no, after, 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 after the line. Okay. Come on. Um, you can use the ksuba as a way to annul the vow. Now, we're going to see there's a whole story that otherwise it, it's not understood what it means until you see the story. There was a story of a person that he said that his wife, um, Another may He won't have benefit from his wife, or his wife won't have benefit from him. I'm not sure which way it's going. He forbids her from deriving benefit. I guess that what that means is that he can't remain married to her. Well, he's a ksuba tough dinarim, and the ksuba was 400 dinarim. A lot of money. Olafne Rabbi Akiva comes to Rabbi Akiva. The chayvalit naksubasa says, "Okay, you took the vow. You have to divorce her, and you have to give her the ksuba." 400 dinar, it's a lot of money. Amalai Rebbe, chesmeis dinar min yechaba. One second. His father left an inheritance of 800 dinar. However, not the lachi dalad meis, vani dalad meis. My brother took 400, 50%, and I got 400, 50%. Can't we split it equally, me and her? I'll take 200, she'll take 200. Amalai Rebbe Kiva, afilo atamaychash sa reishcha atanaitala, atanaisin lak subasa. Even if you have to sell the hair on your head, that would mean sell it to make a wig or something. So, um, but whatever the case is, you, she's getting her ksuba. You're not, uh, you're not splitting it. She's getting the whole thing. Amrlai, so he tells to Rabbi Kiva, I knew I was going to lose so much money. I never would have taken that vow. Rabbi Kiva said, oh, okay. So we'll annul the vow. So to hear what we're saying, that you can use the ksuba as a way to annul the vow. Kumar asks a question on the detail here. It was a detail that he was going to have to give her 400 dinarim. Does metatli mi mishtabi l'ksuba, l'ksubasa? Does she actually get from the ksuba his cash? She doesn't get cash. She's supposed to get land for the ksuba. Amar Abaya, by answers, karka shavachas dinar. My father left, this is what the guy says, Father left for uh, 800, um, the value of 800 dinar, a property, the value of 800 dinar, an apartment in Manhattan. You mean the Ksuba wrote that she was supposed to get land? No, the, in general, the Ksuba um, is collected but when, in land. It can be collected from land, but cash is always referable. Oh, yeah. It's Okay, so one second, one second. The Gemara now says, Vakhtani but we said that he has to sell the hair on his head. Now, this we said clearly that movable objects are not, uh, are not um, mshubit to the ksuba, are not, are not mortgaged to the ksuba. So, yeah, it wasn't a toupee. Well, maybe it was a toupee, actually. Um, that's clearly, Rabbi Kiva says, you're going to have to sell your hair. So that's clearly metalpolin. That's clearly a personality, right? But I'm curious, it seems like they divided their holdings like equally. Right. Um, but it doesn't appear that the older. Maybe there's an older sister. That the doesn't. Firstborn, there are two women, they divide equally? No. Because the firstborn gets. Firstborn would get if he's actually the firstborn. But if there was a girl that was born first, so she doesn't inherit. Oh. But the brothers inherit equally. It's a good point. So, uh, this is what it means. You're going to have to give her everything that you own, even if that means that you're going to be left with selling your hair to be able to eat. We see from this, look at what's going on. Usually when there's someone that owes money. So the best then goes in and say, look, we can't take away everything from you. We're going to have to leave you with a little bit for you to live. And what do you need to work? You're going to have to, it's called massage, and they arrange the, the, the things that what he's able to pay and what he and what he needs to for his uh, immediate uh, use for his life. So it comes out from this. Ain Masad and Balchev, Kiva says he's going to have to sell his hair, he's going to have to sell it, give everything, even though he, this is just a, he's, a, uh, he's, in, he's in debt. So, but what happened to Masad and Balchev? Obviously, you don't do that. 
Rav Nachman by Yitzchak, it doesn't actually mean that in massage on the Bakhay that you don't arrange his property that he should be left with something to be able to live. That's not what it means. What it means is, is that ultimately he's going to have to give everything. It means if he says, okay, we see you only have 200 now, they take the 200 and they leave him with whatever he needs to live. But that doesn't mean that the payment is already complete. They're going to, it's a whole payment plan. You're gonna to have to come back and get the rest of it. It's not that they say, okay, you pay whatever whatever you have now. No, no, no. It's a it's going to linger on and until he pays it up. That's what Rabbi Kiva was saying. Let's leave it here.